Hey, there it is, my card. <laughs> so what do you got going on, Simone? Um, so it's basically um, leadership. So um, it's about the agile, like little A, so a culture shift for government. And it's just how to get leadership aligned on, you know, big A versus little A and what they want for outcomes for that culture shift. Like, how are we going to measure success? And it seems like, you know, everybody has their own sort of um, initiatives or agendas, objectives, and it's just, how do you herd the cats? <laughs> so when you, um... When you talk about big A versus little A, tell me what you mean by that a little bit. Okay, so little A is more um, that anybody can do, have agility or, or practice agility in any position that they're holding. So, you know, in, in your regular job, where big A, um, agile, is really about the agile teams, like so practicing the, the you know, the manifesto, the, the methodology, um, so that's actually being in an agile team. Okay, Simone, and just be patient with me. Um, when you say anybody can be agile in their job, what does that mean? It means like to be flexible, innovative, to have more collaboration, open, transparent communication, uh, be willing to, you know, take that leap of faith and make mistakes and know that it's okay, that there's safety in doing that and it's part of exponential learning. And why, why would a leader want that in their organization? Well, in BC government, we are trying to shift the culture to that, to be more innovative and responsive to um, quicker res response time and more responsive to um, client service needs, as well as what benefits we're delivering. So how would you get people to behave that way? Um, having leadership communicate out and creating a safe environment for people to be able to feel supported to do that, to be, you know, to, to change that culture. Cool. If I'm a leader, why do I want, I'm trying to, I'm trying to walk you into an answer rather than just dictate it and see if, see if we can get there. Um, yeah. Why do I want to be more innovative um, in my organization, like what does a leader, how, how, let me, let me back up to this. How are your leaders being measured and promoted and rewarded and paid attention to? How do we know that they're getting um, what's expected from the being more agile, from the innovative? We don't right now. <laughs> yeah, so there you go. So here's the challenge. <clears throat> so first off, first off, asking people to behave in a more agile fashion if it doesn't help them get better at doing their jobs that deliver value to the organization, a leader is never going to support it because leaders are paid to make sure the organization achieves their objectives. Mm -hmm. And the strategic, um, the strategic flag of we need to be more agile is attractive. Maybe people want to work there. People might be trying to do it. But at the end of the day, there's got to be some reason why being more agile helps us achieve the goals of our organization. So what we want to do is we want to align being more agile with the goals of the organization so that leaders want to support it and then show them how we're going to actually make those changes in a way that's safe for the leaders to help them get there. Because what's the other problem with, with leadership, um, with going agile? Let's let people just make their own seeds, be more, feel free to fail, do what you feel like doing. What does that sound like to somebody who's responsible for delivering an outcome to the organization? Does it sound safe? Or does it sound dangerous? It's dangerous. Yeah. So we're asking the executive to support something they don't understand how it, how it advances their goals or the goals of the organization. And we're asking them to do it in a way that it sounds really dangerous to them. So is that going to get them aligned? No. <laughs> Got it, right? So that's, and this is like the common failure mode. So what we want to be able to do is figure out how to get them first to understand why we need this agility to be successful in our organizations. And it has to do with um, uh, three things. One is, is 
Um, there's a lot of expertise on the ground where you're engaging with the market and we can't make decisions at the top level. We have to create context and delegate decisions down into the organization mm -hmm. so that those decisions can be, can, can be made closer. Because otherwise, leader, you have to make every single decision and you're not the one closest to it. You don't understand the detail and it's going to be hard for you to do that. So that's, that's one reason why we want to be more agile. We want to create an organization that we can delegate decision making into so leader, you can be successful and not have to make every decision. Another thing that we want, leader, is we have to be able to make work flow. And one of the things that happens when everybody's operating in individual silos on their tasks and everything has to be escalated, or there is such a challenge for um, getting ideas between people's heads to get to the outcome, that can't go up through the executive and make leader and come down either. So we have to figure out how to create the conditions where people are working here. This is why teams are such an important part of Agile. We have to get some teams or at least some persistent teaming cadences in place where people have the right conversations. And then we have to create a context where we can delegate those decisions down, but we know that they're staying safe for us. So I have to be able to create things like um, uh, if you're using epics and epic is a way to say, here's the problem I need you to solve. Let's have a meeting, talk about how you're gonna solve it. And you guys go off and work with the details and we're gonna meet every week or two to talk about how you're on track or not. Like the power of the techniques gives the executive what they want. I, I, in order to be successful, mm -hmm. I've got to set these teams up to operate with clarity, with the ability to get ideas between their heads. But I have to, for me, create safety. They're not just going off and doing whatever the heck they want to do. So how am I going to measure alignment? So it's a cadence and a teaming structure and a communications thing that's necessary to achieve your executive thing. So what we're doing is we're starting with, with the structures and the behaviors and the outcomes that are necessary to achieve their goals. Now within that, the acts of being agile, the behaviors of being agile will be how you are successful and that culture will begin to emerge. But if you start with the culture without creating the clearing and conditions around it, without creating safety um, for the executives, um, it's gonna fail. Uh, so Helena, a lot of times um, there's, there's like three different ways that we talk about this. Backlogs are a great way to establish clarity on what we're measuring against. Because a backlog of epics is, here's the outcomes I need for you to solve for. I need to solve these problems for these customers. And here's what it looks like when it's done. I have context to measure success that I can delegate into the team. It's a delegation model that creates safety for the leaders, but it also creates clarity for the team so we don't get off sync. Then there's a cadence of, um, of, of meeting that we're talking about, are we still on track? So there's a, there's, there's a way of delegating that epics are intended to create safety for. We've also been using at scale in bigger organizations, um, OKRs. Um, Simone raised her hand again. I, I'm, oh, sorry. Um, Helene, we're all, we've, all started, we've also started to use OKRs at a strategic level, not as a performance management accountability system, but as a strategic clarity system to come up with another framing of what are the key results we need to accomplish, which become a framing to pull epics and features and stories into. The cool thing about, about using OKRs is I can put the work that's on the system, the changes we have to make as an organization to behave better as a key result, as well as customer outcomes as key results. So creating a frame of OKRs, which, and, 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 and a, um, a measurement system. I've got to get this dashboard out to you guys. I've been talking about it for two months and I've got, I'm actually building it for a client, so I've got to get it out. But um, getting, getting OKRs, getting super clear in the epics, making sure that we're collaborating effectively on the work that's going into teams, making sure we have a clear measurement of how our organization needs to operate. These are all the conversations, and it's all about creating safety for the executive. Um, does that answer your question at all, Helena? Yeah, I, I think I just didn't understand what was all the like what exactly were the, all the different variables that be, are being measured. But now that you said that you're also creating a dashboard and you have one to get out there, I think once I see that, it would be a little bit even more clear to me. Yeah. So thank you. Yep. There's a, and, I'm, and there's actually stuff about what we're doing with the dashboard, how it connects to what we're going to change. Because the other thing, the team doesn't want to be measured if it can't be improved and it's just going to be held accountable for things it can't accomplish. So there's, there's an interesting, there's a dynamic that goes around the metrics that becomes really important that I, I'm going to get presented this month. Tim will hold me accountable to it. 
Simone, did you raise your hand again? No, I'm good. I just uh, had a question of okay, what are OKRs, but I got it. Oh, that's cool. Um, objectives and key results. There's a book by a guy named John Doerr you can read on. We've got some stuff on our website on them. Um, we'll be doing, um, uh, we're supposed to be getting a webinar out in the next month on it. Um, I don't know if that's scheduled. We're supposed to be getting arranged. I don't know if we've actually arranged it with our marketing group yet. And it, this whole concept of measurement, again, might be a good topic for, for next month if I can get the paper and the OKR stuff out this month. But objectives and key results. What we're talking about is saying our strategic objective is to solve these problems for these customers in these markets in order to achieve these financial goals. That's like an outcome or an objective. And then our key results can be things like, and I need to have um, agile teams working together around this product. And I need to be able to get really, really clear backlogs. And I need to get, um, I need to understand the top three problems for the, for the, um, for the market. It turns it into like a, a more actionable sort of series of things that we can work on together as opposed to going, hey, go get some agile and, uh, and work on these backlogs. Like that doesn't create safety for either the teams changing or for the leaders that are trying to get aligned. So the, the trick is that that series, yeah, Afzal raised his hand, that, 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 the, the, the entry, that, that, that series of questions I asked up front are the ones to go through your brain on is what matters to the executive and how am I going to connect his, why am I going to, how am I going to create a hole in his heart or her heart for creating agility in the organization? And then how am I going to make agility be the best way for us to accomplish the goals? Because if you don't answer those questions, then you're not going to get support. Absolutely. I'll go ahead and ask your question. Hey, Dennis, you mentioned three things. One is the delegate decision-making. Second is to make workflow. What was the third thing? I missed that. Um, a cadence. So I'll, I'll talk, uh, I've, I've actually got like cadence. I'm sorry, I've got, sure. I've got clarity, competence, and um, capacity. So we have to put in visualizations around those three things so that an executive knows when he's delegating, he's getting back what he wants. Then there's a cadence of review where you're having conversations around all three of those. It's the model, it's the delegation model. If I don't create clarity around what I'm delegating and clarity around who makes which decisions when and clarity on the output or the outcome I'm expecting to produce, like that's a problem. If I don't make sure that I understand if the team actually has everything necessary to deliver, so there's a competence conversation and then there's a capacity conversation. Um, do you have enough bandwidth to deliver this or what else is in flight? And that's where like visual tools and Kanban boards and things like that can solve, can create space for those conversations and um, and create clarity around it. Thank you. All right, on to the next one. <clears throat> so if Bjorn, you wanna come on and chat with Dennis a little bit and anybody else who wants to join the conversation, it's welcome. Yep. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Yeah, so I guess a little context here. So we're, we're practicing Agile and Scrum to some degree in a, a non-software environment. Um, we have dedicated project teams that tend to address some pretty critical problems or developments that need to occur in the organization. So we have leadership backing from the point that they, they see it as a way of working to address uh, very important problems. But we're still at a point where we just have very limited, uh, you know, one-off teams that are assigned to these projects. And, uh, we, you know, we have issues with resource commitment to, to, to continue delivery. And, you know, we have issues with the organization that needs to surround these teams to be, help them be really successful because uh, we tend to develop an understanding of agile ways of working and mindsets and scrum practices within the teams, but then the, the people who need to surround them, the leadership that need to support it are really, uh, you know, not connected the same way. So it just seems like to go forward to be more successful with this, to expand it further, we need to, we need to address agile leadership to really, uh, you know, enable the teams to continue uh, being successful. Yeah. Um, Bjorn, of the stuff I just talked about a moment ago, did some of that um, give you some ideas around um, how to approach it? Because it's, it's kind of the same conversation. It's, um, it's, 
nobody wants to do agile. There's not, there's not a leader in the, in the world who wants to do agile unless, unless their job is to deploy agile into the organization and they're measured by how much agile gets deployed. Right. And if you got that person, then they may not be doing the right things anyway. Um, so the bridge is to understand, listen, you've got, you've got volatile work that requires um, near time decision making around complex issues by experts. And those experts have to be able to talk to each other. And um, you can't literally process this work. So the cl there's classes of problems that you're solving that just can't be solved with a big upfront project plan led by an executive. You're not gonna be successful. So here are some things that we need to get to. I think, I think the biggest steps are get the leadership to understand why they need a different way of working, explain to them how they're actually more successful at solving the problems they need to solve in this new model, and then show them how they're gonna have safety in delegating the work into the system. Because today when they're totally controlling it, when they're managing every aspect of it, it is the safest place for them to be. They're micromanaging. If they could have a trusted system to delegate into, they'd be really happy to step back. Is that responsive at all to your, I saw you raised your hand, so I stopped. Yeah, yeah, that definitely resonates. I, I think the honing in on the why they need it's a really big one. Uh, maybe you could expand a little bit more on how to, the, how to demonstrate to them the safety part of it. Because getting, like you said, getting them to let go of the control and command style and for them to take the risk to understand that they're going to still have safety even when they do delegate this, this responsibility. I mean, I don't know if you can expand on that or maybe highlight some of the ways we can demonstrate, um, you know, demonstrate that to leadership. Yep. Have, 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 have your executives ever asked for something, your leadership ever asked for something that they didn't get and then they were surprised at the end when they didn't get it? Oh, of course. Have your executives ever asked for something and you built it and when you got done, it wasn't what they expected? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, that's kind of why we've tried to go to this model is because there's a, you know been so many big projects like this where it's not clear up front what really needs to be built, the team starts to try to build the solution. And at the end, yeah, you have misalignment between stakeholders and, you know, the people doing the work. You know, you know, all the conversations and activity that you had at the end, once you had missed to pull it all together in crisis mode and all the rework that was done to pull it together and save it at the end, all those conversations. How about if I had a model to spread all those conversations out and flow over a period of time, not all crammed up at the end, so we're not under duress. And I sequenced the work so that we could drive the risk down earlier, let you see where we are uh, and get feedback from you to make sure we're on track. What if I had a system that created twice as much transparency into our progress and, our, and, and verified our understanding of the problem and allowed you to actually maybe even uh, make some changes as you learned what you wanted? Would you prefer to operate in that way or would you prefer to Pretend like we can decide up front what the problem is and then hope we got it right when you get it at the end. He's gonna yeah, get I'm following you. That's a great that's a great way to put it. Yeah. But it's but but you're not taking anything away from them. The, the, the challenge that we use all the time is this language of loss. We're gonna you have to let you have to trust the team, you have to give up control, you have to do blah blah blah. We give up, we give all of these just things that if you're a leader, if you're the person responsible for the delivery and you're asking them those questions, there's no way they're gonna support that. It creates risk for them. But, but you know what? I wanna create hope for you, a desire to take a risk to get there. I'll tell you what, the risk on this, I, and let me tell you a line I've used a number of times, Warren. Um, if my job was on the line for delivering this project, I would definitely do it in an agile fashion because there's no way we're gonna get it right in the waterfall way we've always done things. And you know that to be true, Bjorn, you know that's true. So work with me to build this other thing, help me make this other thing happen because that's our greatest chance of success. Yeah, um, Andres had a question. Yeah, sorry, I just uh, actually lost my train of thought as well. <laughs> I was listening to you and reflecting on something else. Um, <laughs> if it comes back, I'll, I'll come back to you, sorry. Okay, um, so, so that's, that's the trick on that is, is it's a different offer. It's a different, um, it's a different opportunity. Bjorn raised his hand again, he's ready. So, 
You know, one one thing that in terms of demonstrating the value, uh, you know, we've done a good job of that at the team level with the projects themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you already probably answered this to some degree, but I'll try to ask it in a little bit different way. It, it's easy to show why working in an agile manner can help the teams deliver better, deliver higher quality outcomes, et cetera. It's harder to convince the leadership how changing their behavior is gonna help deliver outcomes. So again, I'm trying to always bring it back to the, the leaders because that's really where we seem to be running into a wall is it's quite easy to bring people on board in this way of working and have them enjoy it and be more engaged. But it's, it's again, I'm looking for more angles um, or more suggestions you can have on angles to, uh, to kind of attack the leadership to open them. Perfect, perfect. What, what behavior do you want a leader to change? What's a behavior you want a leader to change? Um, you, you don't know, have to name them, but just anecdotally. What's a behavior you want a leader to change? Resource commitment or follow through. So they say they're going to form a team and they don't, and then you're still held accountable for delivering. Yeah. And, 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 and then, but then you're held accountable when they didn't deliver what they said they would. So what I would do is I would make darn sure that I'm measuring um, as a metric and reporting up because it's just, it's just unreasonable to expect us to deliver what, what, what we said we would with a certain level of resource capacity and I don't have it. But if we wait till the end to complain about it, it's very ineffective. But if I'm measuring every two weeks, um, resource commitment was met, resource commitment was met, and I'm showing the impact and the delay that that lack of resource is having, um, I'm going to put accountability back in the lap of the leader. And they, they, they have to, like, like it's just, it's impossible to, for them to say, we'll get it done anyway. Right? I mean, if they're doing that, then you're probably working at the wrong company. I think most of the time, we're very reticent to say to our executives, because we want to be heroic and we want to be successful. We're very reticent to say to them, you know, that, that inability to deliver the resource in two weeks is going to cause a delay. And at the end of two weeks saying, we didn't have the team that we needed and the project is now delayed. I need you to pull some scope out, extend the date, or um, give me twice as much resource next month. But that's actually probably gonna be problematic anyway, because you couldn't even get me the one. But I think we take on risk because we're trying to be heroic and solve for problems in impossible circumstances. So we'll talk a lot about creating stable teams, knowing what capacity is, and then asking the business to invest in the capacity that's available. I think I have to stop talking about this one. Yeah, let's see if, uh, if Jeff had a comment before we, he did raise his hand. Let's see if Jeff has a comment for him. I didn't see that. I'm sorry, Jeff. Oh, that's okay. Hey, uh, thanks, Dennis. R just real quickly, you mentioned something that I heard in Sound Notes uh, podcast a while back uh, about the language of loss. I, I, I know in this context of this question, maybe it, it doesn't make sense to keep talking about it, but it, I would love to hear a little bit more on that because I thought that was a good concept. It's it's so important. Just trust the team. Uh, fail, and so then the next question I think is about trust or somebody raised a trust question. It was great. Um, just trust the team. I'll talk to you here about things to avoid when trying to get executive leaders. Yeah. So whoever's card that is, if y'all want to raise your hand. Um, and then I think this actually has, so Andres uh, put it in the chat, his question came back to him, you know, agile leadership demands a different type of responsibility and more time spent with the team, not just in report outs. I wonder if that has something to do with this card as well. Like what are we, what are our expectations of executives and, and that kind of thing? Yeah. Um, so um, Jeff, language of loss, um, things to avoid when trying to get executive leaders to lead agile, just trust the team. We need to fail fast, give the team what they need and stand back and let them deliver. Um, the, the, none of those things are going to executive to go do any of those things because it, because it, it, it makes it riskier for them to be successful. So this language of loss concept, when we're talking about to executives, we're always talking about what's in it for the team and what executives have to give up to get there. Um, you just have to let us fail all the time. You just have to let us sort of figure out how we're going to do things as we're going. You can't, you can't hold us accountable for anything is what they hear. And the executive's going, so you're telling me I'm just going to spend all this money and let you guys build whatever you want to. And, um, and I don't get to have any control. And it's like, that's, it's insanity from their point of view. Right. And so what would we do if we, if we looked at it from their point of view and how we can create safety for them, 
do not get into language of loss with executives. I think that's a huge failure. The other thing is, is don't, oh, this is, this is excellent. Don't make a promise that you can't keep. So don't say, if you just let us form these agile teams, we'll be super successful. Go, here's the thing, man. If I can't get a relatively stable team with everybody dedicated to it, sticking together uh, with a really, really clear backlog and let us balance capacity and demand and give me the ability to deliver frequently, um, you're not going to get what you want. But if you want to get what you want, the only way to get there is to give me a stable team that stays together with everything needed to deliver an increment of value, get me really, really clear backlogs and let us plan together collaboratively around it. And then review where we are to make sure that that we're, that we're giving you what you want. That's what I need from you. Oh, and by the way, um, it's, it's the exact same conversations we're having at the end when we screw up all our, all our projects we're currently doing. So we're just spreading them out, doing them at a better time in the right order, right? People in the room at the right time, having the right conversations. Um, but, but you can't tell executives they're stupid, they don't have a strategy, um, that they're the cause of the organization not delivering, even though from your perspective, they might be. You can't tell them they have to be different. Um, you have to tell them what different looks like and what's in it for them, right? Because here's what executives hate. Executives hate their teams getting blocked all the time or frozen or building the wrong thing or going off with, on going off in a direction, making assumptions that aren't clear. Like executives hate that. So don't tell them we're going to go dark and make it less clear with less definition, with less ambiguity. We got, we got to tell them we're going to give you more insight, more clarity, more opportunity. And by the way, it isn't more conversations than you've had. It's not more energy than you've had to pour into this in the past. It's more consistently applied over time on more focused areas. Because remember, when things blow up, you're spending weeks and weeks untangling stuff that we messed up. So, so I don't know that it's more time. I think it's different time and a healthier interaction. Um, whose was this? I think I started talking before I let whoever card this was speak. Hey, Simone. Hey. Did, did you want to provide some context? I just started rambling. I got excited. Um, no, it, 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 uh, it makes sense what you're saying, though. So in, in terms of context of this card, it's just like um, in trying to get leaders, executive to lead agile and to take some ownership of that, um, you know, what are some landmines to avoid? Because I don't, you know, if I can avoid stepping on them, then I'd rather do that. <laughs> yeah, language of loss. If you can talk about agile without using any jargon at all and only talk about what, um, what they would like, um, you can get them to buy into it. If you think about this as, um, there's just this term that I use, I actually learned it from um, Ellie Goldratt, is we have to create a hole in their heart for what we need them to do. And so we have to be thinking about it from their point of view, what safety and success looks like from them. And we don't want to do things that appears to take that away from them. But here's what's interesting. I'd rather say it's going to be hard and expensive and take more of your time like that's not language of loss. That's just real. I'd rather be saying that than saying, um, well, you, ha you have to loosen the range. You can't do this command and control stuff. Like we're just telling them what they can't do. Mm -hmm. Instead of telling them, so here's the deal. Let's get super clear on the frame and how we're going to communicate. Let's set up a cadence of meetings where we're looking at it. We will show up every single time. If, if you want to read like the speed of trust, that's like a great book to talk about. We're trying to build trust with the executives to trust the system. Well, we trust the system by being trustworthy. So what are little things we can start to do to be trustworthy? Because when we go do agile stuff, but still miss the deadline and miss the date, and there's no transparency and everything's still messed up. It's actually worse. And they're blaming the process that we put in because if the process doesn't incorporate them in all those decisions, we didn't actually do what we were supposed to do. So I want to tell them what they're going to do, what it's going to take, how they're going to help be successful. I'm going to give them lots of, safety and direction and guidance so they'll step in and help cool. all right what are we on all right here um next card sorry i have a bunch of zoom things all on top of my board here 
All right, looking for maturity models. Cool. Afzal, what are you really looking for? Are you looking for? Um, uh, yeah, I, I was a uh, Scrum Master. I'm, I'm still a Scrum Master. Um, recently, there was some reorg, and uh, I took a position of um, a manager role for the Scrum Masters, uh, lead role. Um, the organization doesn't have a clear um, role or, or responsibility set up for this. I'm just trying to establish um, some clarity around this role and also for the Scrum Masters. Uh, if there is anything that I could use as a starting point uh, to coach, uh, to mentor the Scrum Masters, to have some kind of um, uh, maturity model or roadmap, uh, how do we measure ourselves? How do we make sure you are, we are constantly uh, in improving? That's what I'm looking for. Um, <clears throat> cool. When we're, I'm gonna talk a little bit leading agile and how we go recruit coaches and the model that we've built around it. Um, the, the skills and experiences is one of the first things that we look at. So um, having a skills matrix for what are the job roles of a scrum master, you can find those on the internet. Um, uh, I don't know if we have anything publishable on it. We might, um, we can look into that, but it's not hard to come up with a list of um, what are the practices a scrum master has to be good at. It becomes really interesting um, is your scrum master a coach or is your scrum master a, a process expert holding the team accountable to the process? Because those two things get really blended in our industry. Like the initial intent of a scrum master and what they teach in a CSM class is not how to think about the big system. Like they don't teach coaching things in a CSM. Yep. So, so what are you looking for? Are you looking for agile coaches? that you're gonna embed in the team in a scrum master role? Or are you looking for um, scrum masters to facilitate the cadence of meetings and accountabilities between all the members of the, of the, of the scrum network? I'm looking, you... for, looking for the scrum masters to become coaches. Yeah, because that's a very different skill set mm -hmm. than a scrum master. So what you need is you need, you need, you need a coaching skills matrix. What skills? and experiences does a coach need to have. Then there's a thing that we do where we talk about their beliefs and behaviors. So does there, there are some scrum coaches that believe, and if it's what you want, that's cool, but they believe that scrum is about people feeling good about their jobs, being engaged, feeling safe to make mistakes. So they're team focused, and they think the goal is to create safety for the team. If you believe that, you need, to have, you need to find coaches that have that set of beliefs. If you believe the role, of a, the role of a coach is to set the team up for success to achieve the business goals, and that, and that achieving our business goals is how we get the agency in our organization to create safety for the team, but we're doing it, we're, we're not doing it, we're not doing it, like is the scrum master and the coach there to protect the team from awful management? or is it to give management what they need so that they'll create space for the team? Like those are two very different mindsets. So I think you need to understand what the coach believes and you need to have a point of view on what you're looking for. I personally believe that a coach's job is to teach a team how to take control of their destiny by being successful and creating space for them to grow and learn. I don't think it's management's job to step back and just let it happen magically. So the coach has to help a team. You know, we'll talk a lot about in our engagements, um, uh, making sure that we're measuring something that creates evidence for the next problem to solve. So a coach needs to understand that what we're doing is we're going to operate this way, but the next problem to solve is this one. And so we're going to capture data that shows that's the next problem because that's be self-evident to management. It's not about the coach and the scrum master fighting with the organization to protect the team. Coach's job is to create space and opportunity for everybody to learn on the team and around the team. So I need somebody that thinks about bigger systems and not just how to protect the team. Then we have a thing that we go through, which is around behaviors, which is 
do the coach do, do they have a propensity to get mad and hold a grudge are they good facilitators will they hold their space or cave in like what do you really want from a coach we have a thing that we do called people dna but there's hundreds of like profile um um instruments out there to understand assessments out there to understand how people might behave um but i need to know like like is a coach that is uh uh, righteous and dogmatic and going to fight the world to protect his team? Is that the behavior that I want? Or do I want somebody that can calmly hold their ground, explain and educate and bring people along? So there's, what do I want in a coach? Get that written down first. You, there, there, we have a pretty good model built internally. We're pretty intense with what we do. But I don't think that just looking at, um, or you could build a maturity model on that too. You know, you could kind of go, are they aware of it? Are they practicing it? Are they proficient? Are they an expert? Like I would love to have like that list of skills and abilities listed out and talk about where they are on the curve um, and then come up with a plan for how you would develop those. So there's like a selection thing from maturity model and there's a development part uh, for a coach. Um, so I think it's a very powerful sort of place uh, to get to off. So I was pulling all that together. We probably have some stuff it's a product owner supposed to do the with executive scrum master protect the team. Well, so that's what they say, right? Scrum master job is to protect the team from all, but, but they're also supposed to go reconcile, um, go resolve the impediments the team ran into this sprint. Well, most of the scrum masters in any organization of any size don't have the agency to even go in the room and the meetings and have those conversations. We don't have the structures and cadences built up to escalate dependencies for the teams. So I think we put scrum masters in difficult positions. Um, is the product owner supposed to be interfacing with the um, executive over the scrum master? I don't know if that's true or not. Um, yes, in dogmatic stuff, but if my scrum master is actually my coach, the coach needs to be talking to the leader about how to help, how to support the system and elevating the leadership into it. So I don't want to isolate my coach from leadership. I want them engaging with leadership. My product owner owns the product. The coach's product is a well-functioning organization and not just the scrum team. So there's, there's like, they're both product owners, aren't they? Mm -hmm. And they're collaborating together to build the system that, that maximizes their ability to be successful. So, so in that case, I wouldn't, put, I wouldn't keep my scrum. That's why my question was, are you really looking for a scrum master or are you looking for scrum coaches? And, I, and if you're looking for just scrum coaches, your scrum coaches also, I believe, have to be able to help the product owners be successful in their job. They can't just be teaching the practices and processes. They have to help get the backlogs built as well. So they have to be able to know what a good backlog looks like and how to elevate that. And I think that's actually a failure mode in our industry that people that get CSMs and CSPOs think that they are able to coach the product owners because they know the they know the practices of building backlogs, but they don't know the they don't they don't have the chops to actually connect to the customer and articulate it well because they a lot of times didn't come up through the product world. So I think, I think it's interesting to be really super clear on what you're looking for and what all you need mm -hmm. um, as you're selecting them. But that concept of a skills matrix, and I, I, I'll look and see what we have that we can publish. A lot of things we've done have been built for um, customers. I'm not sure that I have something available to make that, that's, like, that's like publicly consumable, but I'd be happy to provide feedback and anything that you're building and, and, um, and give you some guidance on it. Awesome. Thanks, Mr. Dennis. That's wealth of information. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. All right. We're going to move on here to Dennis's favorite topic. I can't read it because I have this poll up in front of my window, but I can close the poll. How to bridge the gap between level team level agile and business level agile. Very cool. So I don't understand if you want to talk about, give me some context on what you're looking for here. Yeah, sure. So um, we are at the very early stages of a uh, yeah transformation into agile. Um, I think we're we're okay with the team level in, in some pilot projects, um, and I think we have buy-in to continue on a team level. But what we really need is for leaders to like middle managers as well to participate actively, not just endorse that this. This happens on the team level, but to actively change how they operate themselves. Um, 
and I find that a difficult step. Yeah, it's brutal, particularly because um, in a lot of cases, we don't have the framing to talk about it and create alignment around it. We don't have the linguistic tools to articulate it and get buy into it. So we, we, if we're not explicit about what we're looking for and we can't align to it, this is, this is really fascinating. It's so closely related to the earlier leadership question, but it's a bit different. Um, Andres, we have a thing that we call um, summits. So we talk about base camps, like what does a team need to look like? Summits are what does the rest of the organization need to look like? And we have a wheel that we talk about what are all the aspects of the organization that create the ecosystem around the teams. You're looking for some ecosystem type stuff. And what's interesting is every one of those steps of the ecosystem has goals that they're responsible for accomplishing for the organization. So we have our delivery teams, we have product management, we have strategy articulation, we have budgeting, we have technical practices, we have um, compliance and controls, we have leadership, we have um, talent and skills up. Like all those people have concerns in the organization that they're responsible for. And when they're not aligned and our agile teams are operating in exceptions to the way that they normally do their jobs, we're going to run into tension in the organization. So part of the thinking around this is creating some clarity on what is the next set of behaviors in the organization that's blocking our ability to be agile and collaboratively taking that apart with them. Because what I want to do is I don't want to start with what's making it hard for me to do scrum. I want to talk about given that we have to operate this way to respond to our market, how does our governance and control process get in the way of that. And if we walk in and say, you have to change your governance and control process so I can be agile, they're gonna say, you have to change your agile so I can do my governance and control. Yes. And we end up in this fight. But the reality is, is you can do both. You have to do both because the governance and control things that they're responsible for don't go away. It's just the way that they're getting to them actually make it hard to be responsive to the market. So what are the, how do I resolve that tension? I get in a room with both groups and I start with, Let's talk about what you actually need to accomplish your goals. What matters to you? Well, we're responsible for making sure that budgets are spent effectively, that we can account for all the dollars, uh, capital to us uh, that's supported by our audit group. We're responsible for all of these um, risk management things within our organization. We're responsible for those things. And you go, let's talk about how a model of stable teams with incremental and iterative delivery with Discipline and tracking of work through the system can help you accomplish those probably better than, they have, than you've ever done it before. And we have to talk about how we're going to design clear backlogs delivered incrementally, stable teams, and frequent checkpoints allows them to accomplish their goals. And what I need is I need your help, compliance and control group, to make sure that we're operating that way. Hey, QA or security or um, um, infrastructure. Um, here's the way that you get in the way of us being agile. Let me talk to you about how I need you to participate here in my planning process so we can give you what we need. Infrastructure, how does agile make your work hard? Well, you give me stuff that I can't deploy because it isn't what you said you were going to give me two weeks ago. You told me you were going to deploy this. Now you're deploying this. I don't have my data center. I don't have my connections. I have none of this set up. So it's killing me. And you go, yeah, that's probably a really unreasonable place for me to put you. I've been operating with an exception to your processes because your processes get in the way. Now let's figure out how to use this incremental and iterative delivery and some sufficient amount of planning and your participation in my backlog and my road mapping so we can give you what you need to protect it because people go to jail when the data centers get hacked and data escapes. The security stuff is real, right? So we can't pretend like it's not the most important thing in the world because it is to them, it's their job. So it's this concept of, looking at the wheel, getting super clear in your head about what their responsibility is and then facilitating alignment around it. Because you're not, you can't expect all those interests to subordinate what they're responsible for um, all of the time. You can't, so we have to find a way to sit down and have the conversation to align their interests with what we're doing. Um, and so it becomes really interesting is where do you start on that journey? So this is where starting with getting the team, like we talk about base camp one, stable team, predictable. Well, what do I need in the organization that not to be um, in an exception? Well, I need to start um, staffing stable teams. I need to move from project-based staffing to product-based staffing. Well, what does that look like? Well, that looks like this. And here's how we've seen that be successful. Okay, now I got my team stable. Now I've got to move into the product management realm. 
Well, what does that look like? Well, the product management realm need, now needs to understand how we connect strategy to execution through these backlogs and maybe OKRs or whatever strategy method you're using to connect those two things together and really clearly articulate who the customer is. So we're going to get product management to connect this better together. And now we can start taking advantage of these predictable teams. But we can also get better at doing smaller batches. Well, now what gets in the way? Well, you know what? Our strategy is not really actionably articulated. We have kind of a hand wavy strategy. Um, I mean, it's great. It just, it can't be connected in an actual way to what we're doing in the product and with these delivery teams as well. So what do we do there? Well, here's how we now go into value propositions and OKRs, a way to better articulate your strategy and then connect what we're rewarding people for achieving their strategies to what we can actually do better. There's like a, like you can walk around that circle, Andreas, and connect the concerns up the stack. Summit one is what I have to do to pick, oh, so are we showing that? I can sort of see it on the screen. We can make this available to you. There's some stuff coming out soon on this as well. Um, Andreas, I'm pretty sure you could get access to it. Um, with That'd be uh, great. With, 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 I'm pretty sure Tim could send it to you here pretty quickly. But that's, but that's sort of those conversations. So what we have to do is we have to understand what the system that we're operating in, because what we've done with Agile for so long is operative the system being technology. And then we use Scrum Masters and Coach and things to protect our Agile teams from the ecosystem. What we have to begin to do to get to business level agility is, is connect the ability to exploit incremental and iterative delivery, the ability to learn and adapt, the ability to create transparency into where we are. We have to learn to connect that to support all those other interests in the organization. And that's a big part of scaling agile into the enterprise. Does that make sense? Was that responsive to your question? Yes, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and in particular, if there's some additional material, that'd be great to look at. Thank you. I can kind of talk about this all day, but. So, so while we're voting or moving to the next question, I think the really cool thing is, um, um, I like this one, um, but I think the really cool thing about, um, about the wheels and summits is it kind of goes back to creating safety for those executives too. When we dismiss their concerns or try to operate with exceptions to all those processes, or talk about how they're getting in the way of what we're trying to do. It's just, it's language of loss, it's destructive behavior. And it's really interesting when it's executive to executive. So instead of me trying to get my, my manager to support my work or my executive to support my work, now we're talking about um, uh, concerns across interests. And it's the same sort of human things matter, but it does end up being an interesting sort of conversation. Um, what are the main characteristics of an agile transformation leader? Um, so the ones that I've seen be, be successful in really leading uh, an agile transformation, and I do, I have to, I actually have, a, um, have to drop right at one as well. Um, but I have, um, they have to be able to think in systems, they have to see the big picture. They have to understand the goal is to deliver business value and respond, learn and respond to our customers more than it is to do anything dogmatically. They have to be willing to blend ideas from different groups together. Like if you think about the characteristics of a leader that can facilitate those conversations we were just having, Andreas, deeply understanding your concerns and why it matters to you, deeply understanding my concerns and finding a way to align those things. That's, 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 so they have to be goal oriented, but they have to be really good negotiators. It's interesting. Do they have to be super high touch relationship people? I'm not sure that the best ones I've seen are like, I like the highest touch relationship people in the world, but they're, but they're inspirational and they're um, systems thinkers and they are problem solvers, they're adaptable. And that enthusiasm brings people um, to a shared understanding of how the organization needs to work. Also this, this concept of the systems thinking idea like the jujitsu or judo thing, you can't get there tomorrow. So what can I do today to earn enough trust to gather the data to prove the next problem, to earn enough trust, to gather the data to prove the next problem. People that can think of that like little incremental organizational shift while still staying true to the physics of incremental and iterative delivery, deeply understanding our customers, responding to what we learn. I think, I think those are the, the main characteristics of an agile transformation leader. Was that helpful, Andreas? I tried to answer it in two minutes. Yeah, thank you.
Very cool. Well, that does bring us to the top of the hour. And I think we all have, have next meetings here, but I'd encourage everybody on the call to uh, follow up with us. If you have any questions, hit Candice, if you need anything else from Dennis or, or me or anybody else, and then also go ahead and hit our events page and sign up for the next things we have going on. The next lean coffee is already up with the next topic. And uh, there's a couple other things up there too. So um, we'd love to see y'all again. Thanks for giving us some time on a Friday and I hope it was uh, valuable for everybody.